Patanjali is an enigmatic figure whose name is associated with several works including grammatical and medical texts. However, the most famous and important text that he is associated with is called the Yoga Sutras. The exact dating of the text is unknown. The scholars are variously dating it from 200 BCE through to around 400 CE, based on the dates that various commentaries on the text were composed. The work forms the foundational text of the Raja Yoga, or Royal Yoga, school of orthodox Hindu philosophy, although scholars and practitioners claim that the school is much older, pointing to references in the Vedas. Commonly, the school is simply referred to as Yoga. What is clear is that Yoga has a close relationship with the dualistic Samkhya school of orthodox philosophy of Kapila and Ishvara Krishna. The Yoga Sutras takes as given the Samkhya metaphysics of a world composed of Purusha, or spirit, and Prakriti, or nature. Purusha is entangled with Prakriti through a state of spiritual ignorance, called Avidya, while the Purusha fails to recognize that it is not entangled with the ever-changing and suffering nature. The only way to escape this entanglement is through our individual spirit, or Purusha, coming to understand its radical difference and non-involvement in the constantly changing Prakriti. However, the yoga system also adds another element to the universe, Ishvara, or the Divine. This is a Purusha who has never come into bondage with Prakriti, and acts as a subject of both devotion and emulation in the Yoga Sutras. The term yoga itself can be loosely translated to the term yoke, and you can even hear the cognate term between the two Indo-European languages of Sanskrit and English. However, in the sense that Raja Yoga refers to the term, it is probably better conceived as spiritual path or discipline. Yoga is about overcoming the bondage of Purusha. Following the Samkhya ontology, the first product of Prakriti is Chitta, the mind. This is the closest substance to Purusha, although, like all Prakriti, it does not touch the Purusha itself. However, in its closeness, it creates mental activities in reflection of the Purusha. Prakriti, due to the dynamic tensions that nature exists internal to its own being, causes movement and motion. In the mind, this is expressed as vritti, literally whirling. It is this whirling motion which encourages identification with Prakriti instead of Purusha, as the mind is further entangled with bondage. Yoga preaches Niroda, stillness of mind, which is both the method and goal of this discipline. Through Niroda, yoga aims to eliminate mental fluctuations to enable the discrimination between the real and the unreal. With the realization of the distinction between Purusha and Prakriti, the individual is able to achieve liberation. Besides the name Raja Yoga, the school is also called Eight Limbed Yoga. This refers to the eightfold path which Patanjali posits for the individual seeking liberation. This consists of five outer limbs and three inner limbs. The first of the outer limbs is Yama, or restraint. This is a five-fold negative vow to not do certain immoral actions, including ahimsa, or non-violence, similar to the concept in Jainism. This is followed by the avoiding of falsehood, stealing, sexual passions, and greed. It has been summarized by commentators that yama is what you do when others are looking. The second outer limb is niyama, or observances. These are a five-fold series of religious duties, including purification, being content, undergoing austerity, undergoing the study of religious texts, and the surrender to Ishvara, or God. In the contrast to Yama, Niyama has been described by commentators as what you do in private, the internalization of the external rules of Yama. The next three of the outer limbs have to do with the specific conditioning of the mind in preparation for the threefold inner limbs. They also have these aspects most associated in the popular imagination with the term yoga. The third limb is asana, which literally translates to seat. This actually refers to the use of postures used to discipline the senses, and this is where the contortion and positions commonly associated with modern secular practices which many in the West desire from yoga. The fourth limb is pranayama, or breath control. 
This checks the prana, or life force, and controls it in an attempt to reign in the mind as it continuously spins and the constantly buzzing vritti. The finer outer limb is pratayahara, which loosely translates to abstraction. This is the process of separating the senses from stimuli, encouraging them to follow the nature of the mind. With these three meditative branches mastered, the practitioner is ready to undergo the three inner branches of yoga. The first of the inner limbs is dharana, translated as concentration. This involves focusing the mind on a singular object, and highlights the use of the former three limbs as the preliminary steps to meditation. The second of the inner limbs is dhyana, or meditation. This is the state which is achieved through rigorous practice and the dispassionate disposition, which allows the cheetah to reach a state called the one-pointed mind. The final limb is samadhi, which can be loosely translated to as concentration. This is described as a trance-like state in which the mind is completely absorbed in the object of meditation. Classically, this is thought as a phase which gives the potential to grant mystic powers, but these powers are not the aim or goal of yoga. The aim is liberation. Having attained samadhi, the individual can pursue liberation, which in the yoga system is described as kaivalya, or aloneness. This is the process of emulating Ishvara in no longer being caught up in the misconceptions of pr prakriti, liberating our purusha from bondage. Yoga remained an important part of orthodox Hindu thought, complementing Samkhya thought and bleeding into other Hindu schools, as well as Buddhism and Jainism. One of the key aspects that needs to be remembered is that Patanjali and the practitioners of his school saw the text more so as a guide than a philosophical text. Patanjali warned repeatedly against attempting to approach meditation through the intellect, stating that wisdom lies beyond conceptual frameworks. In this way, he highlights again the divide in Indian dualism, which sees the mind as part of Prakriti, and that only through first-hand meditative experience that we can free our Purusha from bondage.